From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo. This is from the South. A 17-year-old Palestinian working as a volunteer medic was shot dead by Israeli troops in the occupied West Bank. This happened in a refugee camp near Bethlehem. The Palestinian Health Ministry identified the victim as Sajid Muzher. He was reportedly wearing a reflective vest. The Israeli military had no immediate commission on, on to his death, but the Palestinian Health Minister called it a war crime. The violence came as Israeli forces entered the camp to conduct arrests. While he was doing his humanitarian duty, while treating one of the injured, the Israeli criminal occupation shot him with live bullets. The World Health Organization strongly condemned the attack, adding that the protection of health workers, patients and health facilities must be respected at all times. And Omar Shakir from Human Rights Watch told AFP that if confirmed, the teen deaths would be, quote, at least the fourth clearly identifiable Palestinian medic gunned down by Israeli forces in the last year. He urged the International Criminal Court to launch a formal investigation into crimes committed in Palestine. In Colombia, indigenous campesino and Afro-descendant organizations have stressed the importance of their fight in defense of land rights. In a press conference, leaders of ONIC, the main indigenous organization, said they will continue demanding that current government respects the right to land ownership. They also said they won't remain silent and that their protests will continue. And earlier, demonstrators blocked the border bridge which connects to Ecuador. Our correspondent Jose Manuel Jimenez has the latest. The situation of the armed conflict in Colombia is worsening as days go by. On Tuesday, opposition lawmakers urged the government to clarify what its approach and policies on peace will be. At least 140 social leaders have been killed in the last seven months. 50% of those are members of the Colombian indigenous movement. This is one of the main reasons the social minga continues in the southeast of Colombia after more than 16 days. They're calling for a meeting with President Ivan Duque in the department of Cauca to open talks with their leaders. They're also calling for respect for life, territories, and the commitments signed by the previous government that have not been fulfilled. Also, the inclusion of the ethnic issue in the National Plan for Development, and obviously, the implementation of the peace agreements. According to the International Committee of the Red Cross, in Colombia there are currently five armed conflicts going on in different regions. The constant killing of social leaders is evidence of that. Another proof of the armed conflict is the massive displacement of campesinos in different regions. Recently, human rights defenders and the ombudsman have denounced that last March the 21st, in the south of the department of Córdoba and in the north of Antioquia, in Ituango, 120 families were displaced due to the confrontation between armed groups. And also on March the 25th in Rio Sucio in San Jose, 230 feet. And also on March the 25th in Rio Sucio in San Jose, 230 people were also displaced. The humanitarian crisis gets worse in Colombia every day, according to the Ombudsman. In 2019, at least 9,000 people have been displaced. Let's recall that one of the commitments made in the peace agreements was to put an end to paramilitary groups. But as we can see, this has yet to be accomplished. For that reason, social movements say they will continue with their struggle. We thank Jose Manuel for that report. A debate was held on Monday in Colombia's Congress over the political control of the peace agreements and how their implementation can move forward. Many feel that the government of Ivan Duque is deliberately ignoring these discussions in the hopes of putting an end to the agreements. During a debate over the implementation of the peace agreements, Senator Ivan Zapeda announced that he will formally accuse the president and the attorney general for not complying with the peace agreements. I have interjected in front of the investigative commission and the lower house. It may be symbolic, but I have accused the president and the AG of violating the constitution. 
The debate went on without the presence of officials who must carry out the implementation of the peace agreements, like Miguel Ceballos, Commissioner of Peace, and Emilio Artilla, Commissioner of Post Conflict Issues, among others. We have complained to the public prosecutor about the actions of Mr. Emilio Jose Archila and other ministers who failed to come to this meeting with absolutely no excuse. Many feel that peace has not been given the importance it deserves during the seven months of the Ivan Duque's government. He has not even met with the Congress Commission for Peace. We have even asked foreign diplomats to please ask the president to speak with us, but the president has not even considered giving us a meeting. He has not even answered our letters. His attitude is increasingly discouraging. For their part, the Defense Minister once again used the strategy of blaming the previous government for the slow progress of the implementation of the peace agreements. President Duque does not want to put an end to the peace agreements. He wants to implement them. But the problem is that there's no resources for doing so. The few officials of the government who took part in the debate could not say with clarity what their policies for achieving peace is. Delegations from different countries are arriving in Nicaragua for the 8th Summit of the Association of Caribbean States. This comes as the ACS celebrates its 25th anniversary. Representatives from Suriname and Martinique have already arrived. The conference is set to begin on Thursday and end on Friday with the motto, Uniting Efforts in the Caribbean to Face the Consequences of Climate Change. The 25 member states, 9 associate members and 6 organizations will all attend. On Monday, Venezuela faced a new attack on its power system. This was a combined effort of both a cyber attack and physical sabotage on the country's main hydroelectric plant. Venezuelans faced two new attacks on their electrical systems on Monday, March 25th. The first, at midday, revealed to have been an electromagnetic attack was brought under control by the authorities over the course of the afternoon. The first event, with similar characteristics to that perpetrated on March 7th, occurred on Monday at 1.29 p.m. and caused a loss of charge, which was rapidly recovered by workers. And through the coordination of the Bolivarian government with Corpo Elec, recovery was efficient. And from 7 p.m. onward, the system was working at peak performance. But then, at 10 o'clock at night, a second power cut occurred, which went on for more than 12 hours and forced the country to suspend classes and most work activities on Tuesday the 26th. This was after a blaze was started, where transformers at the Guri Dam are located. At 9.47 p.m. on Monday, March 25th, criminals set a huge fire in the transformer area at Guri, which affected three transformers at the station as well as the wiring, which allows transmission. Despite the magnitude of the attack, contingency plans went into action quickly. The power outage meant that the subway was out of service, but a provisional bus system ensured commuting around Caracas continued. We should get used to it, because the opposition are already asking for military intervention and war. What's happening now is just as bad as war. Not having electricity, water, transport or food, it may be worse. They are not causing harm to just one person. We are all Venezuelans. If they care about us, even a little bit, they wouldn't do this. On the other hand, Simón Bolívar International Airport functioned as normal thanks to a generator. Health authorities said medical care was not threatened by the interruption in the power supply, and water in hospitals was guaranteed by tankers nonetheless. The military is now reinforcing the country's power grid. The Bolivarian Armed Forces have been deployed here. We're not going to get tired. We have the will to overcome, to go past any enemy of the country. Our president ordered us to ensure that the electricity system functions, and we will do so. At around midday, electricity began to return, but in an unstable manner, with partial cuts throughout the afternoon. Still, the people are ready for new attacks. I have a battery-powered radio, candles, and a flashlight. But will this continue? I hope not, because this is a problem for everyone.
The Venezuelan public ministry has started a criminal investigation into those responsible for the fire at the plant. Meanwhile, school and work remain suspended for Wednesday. Our correspondent, Madeline Garcia, is in Caracas and has this update. Hola, muy buenos días. Pues, eh, Electricity is still being restored little by little, but it remains partially unstable, given the impact of the latest attack on the power grid, in particularly on the transformers feeding off the dam of Guri. The damage of the fire was such that restoration is taking longer than expected. Nonetheless, workers are making progress despite the difficulties. On Monday, the power grid was attacked twice again. First, at 1.25 p.m., the system was attacked remotely just like on March 7. Once the system was near back to normal, at around 9 p.m., a high-voltage transformer yard was set on fire at the Guri Dam, which provides most of the electricity to the country. Three auto transformers were set on fire, and one was completely destroyed along with the cabling. This is why power is returning in stages and why there was another outage earlier on Wednesday. Nonetheless, contingency plans have been carried out, which include providing energy and clean water for hospitals as well as food, water and transport. In certain areas of the country, the power is still out, but authorities reassure citizens it will return. Citizens remain calm after this latest attack. Venezuelans continue to show great resilience in the face of all these attacks. Many are grateful about the openness of the government about sharing information and how quickly they have reacted to restore power, while also being shocked by images that show the extent of the destruction caused. The prosecutor general has announced that an in-depth investigation is underway on these attacks. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute. Welcome back. Guatemala's Electoral Court is appealing a decision by the Supreme Court that allows the daughter of the former dictator Efraín Ríos Montt to run for the presidency. Suri Ríos has come under fire for her candidacy since the Constitution bans the relatives of leaders of the dictatorship from running for office. Her father, Efraín Ríos Montt, was charged with genocide and crimes against humanity committed during his rule in the 80s. His trial was still in progress when he died in 2018. Our correspondent, Mario Rosales, from Guatemala City, has more. Guatemala's Constitutional Court will have the final say on whether Suri Rio Sosa can be a presidential candidate or not for the next general election in June 16th. Suri Rios is the daughter of General Efraín Rios Montt, who passed away last year. He gained power through a coup d'etat in 1982. However, Guatemala's constitution bans relatives of leaders who came to power through an armed revolt from running for the presidency. So the Constitutional Court is the final authority that will decide if this law applies to Suri Rios as well, who is currently one of the most popular candidates for the presidency. Suri has found support among Guatemalan conservatives and the far right, mainly for arguing that the army be put back on the streets and that the death penalty be reinstated. We thank Mario for that report. In Guatemala, several communities have met in the northern municipality of Rasuja to discuss the threats palm oil plantations pose to their territories. We have more on the environmental battle in this report. These social leaders came from various communities to unite against the palm oil industry in northern Guatemala, which continues to harm people's lives and the environment. Communities have less land for cultivation as companies buy up more and more. We lose our forests for these plantations and even the community area is at risk because these monocultures are expanding at an accelerated level. And water scarcity and contamination is another problem stemming from these plantations. It gravely affects life in the communities, especially children. They poison our waters. Our children suffer from diarrhea, itching, and fever. And why? Because of the oil palm they are planting around our community. Locals have filed judicial complaints about the environmental damages, especially regarding the contamination of the River La Passion. But locals say their complaints have been ignored. 
El río más importante. The river La Pasión es the most important river in our municipality, and now fish die by the thousands due to the pollution. Various universities run water quality analysis and found that the palm oil plantation are polluting the river. Yet, justice never sides with the poor. In the face of this devastating situation, some community leaders decided to take action to stop the expansion of palm oil plantations. We didn't let a company plant African oil palm in our village, even though the company bought three plots in our village. We didn't let them start the war. Over the last decade, the abundance of lush forests and fresh water have attracted the ever-expanding palm oil industry. Today, Guatemala produces seven tons of palm oil per hectare, giving it the highest productivity in the world. But these plantations occupy an area equivalent to land used by more than 60,000 subsistence farmers. Brazil's indigenous Guarani people from the Jaragua lands have stormed the Sao Paulo City Hall to protest against the suspension of indigenous health services. They attempted to move past security guards who formed a human barricade to prevent them from going further into the building. This comes as the Bolsonaro government cut back resources for health care, giving their responsibility to municipalities. He also forced the removal of Cuban doctors from the Maiz Medicos program. The Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has suffered a significant defeat in Congress over control of the budget. Members of the lower house voted by over two-thirds in favor of a constitutional amendment that would reduce the share of the federal budget that, that the president can control. At present, the president has discretion over 10 percent of the budget. The rest goes on to so-called obligatory spending, including salaries and pensions. If passed by the Senate, the amendment would give the executive discretion over just 3 percent. And also in Brazil, the prosecutor's office has rejected Bolsonaro's order to commemorate the military coup of 1964. The institution said in a statement that the idea of celebrating the start of a military dictatorship is extremely serious and a disrespect for democracy. President Jair Bolsonaro ordered the armed forces to properly commemorate the coup that led to a dictatorship which lasted more than 20 years. Eastern Island has started to feel the impact of climate change, affecting mainly, in, mainly its wetlands. The fluctuating temperatures cause a record drought, putting the freshwater reserves at risk and drying the wetlands. More intense swells are also causing soil erosion. Meanwhile, the Salas and Gomez Island, the most scarcely inhabited island in the world, has been seen covered in plastic garbage. Local communities said they are hoping to create environmental policies to address the problem and promote sustainable tourism. Records show that since 2010 there has been a drop in rainfall. The worst was in 2017 when, if I'm not mistaken, there was just 670 millimeters, which is the lowest ever recorded in the history of the island. With this quantity of rain, it dried the entire wetland. Climate change is affecting us directly here in Rapa Nui. As I said, this is because of many things, with drought, rubbish, pollution along the coast, the collapse of our temples. This is affecting us directly. So even if we take care of things here, try to conserve, it will affect us like it will the rest of the world. Algerians have questioned the initiation of Article 102 of the Constitution to remove the president, calling it outdated. The army chief cited the article on Tuesday to declare Abdelaziz Bouteflika unfit to govern. Protesters have said this article is not the solution as the current government will still rule. This follows weeks of mass protests demanding the president step down. The activation of this article could have been done already when he had his stroke, so why suddenly wait until six years later to activate it? But in fact, I think this is not a good solution. It means that the will of the people has not been respected because the motto was clear and precise. The claims are clear for the removal of the entire system. The Caribbean is mourning the loss of one of its most treasured veteran broadcasters. Jamaica's Doreen Samuels has died at the age of 59 after battling cancer. Samuels became a journalist in 1981 after her talent was spotted 
when she visited Radio Jamaica as a finalist in the Miss Jamaica World Pageant. A longtime employee of the Radio Jamaica Gleaner Group, the veteran journalist has been hailed as the gold standard for broadcasting. Her death marks the end of an era when Samuels ruled rules Radio Jamaica airwaves for over four decades. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Seven people, including four children, have been killed after a missile hit a Yemeni hospital. Just one day after thousands rallied to mark four years since the civil war started. Eight more people were wounded in the strike near the entrance of a rural hospital. Health workers were among those killed. Tens of thousands have died during the war between the Saudi-led coalition and Houthi rebels, which has also led to mass starvation and the outbreak of deadly diseases. An attack by suspected Boko Haram fighters in eastern Niger has left at least 12 people dead, including two suicide bombers. According to witnesses, two suicide bombers blew themselves and then scores of gunmen launched attacks on a police barracks and the city hall. In the last 10 years, Boko Haram has killed over 27,000 people and just more than a million across Nigeria, Niger, Chad and Cameroon. Aid continues to arrive in Zimbabwe for the victims of Cyclone Dai, which left a trail of destruction and hundreds of people dead in the Southern Africa region. Despite the significant amount of aid that has already arrived, thousands of people still remain in need of shelter, water, food and medical supplies. The United Nations says Cyclone Idai may be the worst weather-induced disaster to have hit the Southern Hemisphere. People lost everything. So for us to say we oh, need this or that, I think we'll be understating. Whatever anyone can provide, it will be desperately needed. A report by research organization Afrobarometer has revealed that more than one-third of young Africans have considered leaving their countries. But contrary to the notion that North America and Europe are the preferred destinations, the report indicates that most would be migrants within Africa. The report shows that over 58% of respondents interviewed in Southern Africa preferred staying within the region. Dozens of un unidentified victims of deadly flash floods and landslides in Indonesia have been buried in a mass a grave. Nearly two weeks after the disaster, 90 people have been reported missing, while the official death toll stands at 112. Thousands of people in the eastern province of Papua are now living in makeshift tents since the incident. A secretive group known as the Cheolima Civil Defense is taking responsibility for the raid at the North Korea Embassy in Spain. The raid occurred days before a key summit between U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Vietnam last month. The organization hijacked computers and phone and hard drives. Austrian authorities have searched the home of a far-right nationalist group leader in connection to the New Zealand mosque attacks. Martin Seltner, head of the Identitarian Movement of Austria, confirmed that investigators searched his apartment and seized several electronic devices. Seltner allegedly received 1,500 euros in 2018 from a donor with the same name as the mind behind the Christchurch terrorist attack, which left 50 dead. A major development in the UK, British Prime Minister Theresa May says she will quit if her twice-defeated EU Brexit deal passes at the third attempt. May made the announcement during a meeting with Conservative lawmakers. It's seen as a last-ditch effort to persuade opponents in her Conservative Party to back her. The government is now expected to bring the deal back to Parliament for a third vote on, on Friday. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesorenglish.net. 
And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Teresa English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.